Please remember, the information in our podcast could be a trigger for some people. And if you or someone you know has been affected by sexual abuse, the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre 24-hour helpline is 1-800-77-8888. Hello, I'm Joyce. I'm June. And I'm Paula. We're the Cabinet Sisters and we'd like to welcome you to our series of Countly in Podcasts where we continue to shine a light on childhood sexual abuse and its impacts. In this week's podcast, we'll be speaking to Peter Maguire, a freelance journalist who regularly contributes to the Irish Times. He also contributes to Noteworthy.ie, the investigative unit of the journal.ie. His latest articles published on Noteworthy and the journal.ie investigate the experience of domestic abuse and child abuse victims during COVID-19 pandemic. Peter, what got you into journalism? Because I read in your bio there, you worked in UCD. I was a folklore lecturer in UCD and I kind of specialised in contemporary folklore and one of the areas that I wrote about was folklore about missing persons and about child abduction and child abuse kind of going back from you know old records right to kind of contemporary narratives that we hear today so that'd be the type of thing like there's a guy going around the neighbourhood in a white van with a puppy in the back and he's abducting kids those kind of narratives that we hear and part of my work was really exploring them at the same time I was working as a freelance journalist and I kind of just ended up going with with the journalism side of things and so because I'd worked a lot around kind of narratives around children I ended up writing a lot around kids as well particularly around education and then eight years ago I I first got funded by the Mary Raftery Journalism Fund which is a fund for investigative journalists and it was looking at sex education and relationship education in Irish schools and then a few years later, the same fund named after the investigative journalist Mary Raftery, who did so much work in exposing the reality of all sorts of child abuse in Ireland. So I got funded again to look at the experience of child sexual abuse in Ireland. And I did a series of articles for the Irish Times on that. At the moment, I would say on the journals that I am noteworthy, I have a series of articles looking again at the experience of domestic abuse victims uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and what we can do to help them beyond this. And also an article looking at the experience of all sorts of child abuse, including, you know, physical, emotional, sexual as, as well during this pandemic. What steered you in that direction? In terms of writing about child abuse? Yeah. To be honest, I just kind of fell into it because that was some of the work that was available at the time in the Irish Times was in education. I kind of enjoy this. And obviously education led me then into areas that needed to be explored there. I thought one of the big areas was the chronic lack of relationship and sexuality education for children puts them at greater risk of all sorts of abuse, including child abuse. And after I did that work with the Mary Raftery Fund, it kind of stayed on my radar of how awful it must be for children to to have this experience and how, as a society, we're great at talking about, oh, it's awful, let's hang them high and cut their balls off. But when it actually comes down to what needs to be done and the things that we need to do as a society to address child abuse, people tend to bury their heads in the sand to some extent. And I do think the media has a responsibility in that respect about highlight the issues and bring more awareness to it. But also, you know, there are failings on the part of the media as well in how we tackle the issue of child abuse, including obviously child sexual abuse. The way they report on it, the language that they use, saying child porn, when no children are out there making pornography. It seemed to be an ongoing battle there for a while. How the media report on abuse cases, court cases and media stories, because of the power they hold, they still kind of insist on using incorrect representation. Like they're doing a great disservice. Like words hold a lot of power and the media certainly have an amazing influence on people. Also, another issue is how much time is given to each case. When a shocking case comes out in the media, not only do they present it badly, but it gets a 24 hour coverage if they're lucky. And after that, it's just move on to the next. Give us your views on that and your experience around that. 
Certainly in terms of the term child porn, like I think most journalists that I know now would be aware that completely inappropriate term. It should be called what it is, which is child sexual abuse material, because I think brings home the reality to people of what it is. There is a legal problem in that legally it's still called child porn. So you might find very good court reporters who might still kind of have to use that term because that's legally what is being used. I do think that's an issue that legally needs to be taken up. They need to change that name because otherwise it's still going to be used. That sounds like a cop out because if they were legally bound to use that term, well, then they'd all be used. But a lot of them have changed. If it was a legal thing, Peter, it's not legal to have young children in porn movies. I'm not saying it's right, but I think that like legally it would help to change a term. Certainly it's not a term that I would ever use. I do see a lot online when it's used of people actually calling it out, seeing headlines being changed as well. And I think that's a positive thing. In terms of the wider issue of how the media cover this, I'd like to think as a journalist, I've largely tried to cover it responsibly. But like any time I've tried to cover this, I've been given significant funding to do it, including by the Mary Raftery Fund. The noteworthy projects that we've done at the Journal recently, again, we got significant funding and that was funded by the public, that noteworthy project. But to actually do anything that explains the complexity and societal issues with child abuse, it does require a lot of resources and a lot of time and a lot of money. I was able to, with the Mary Raftery Fund's help, put together a series of I think it was four or five different articles in the Irish Times at the time. But it is a lot easier, perhaps, for the media to just report on a very sensational case. And there's actually an interesting piece of research done by this in 1996 by a researcher called McDevitt. And he looked at the reporting of child abuse in Ireland and the state. Really awful cases of child sexual abuse got a lot more headlines than some of the things around, you know, neglect, emotional abuse. And the lurid extreme cases of, like, a stranger abducting someone Obviously, they stand out. It's such a weird, unusual story. And people want to hear those type of stories that are strange and unusual. But that, he found, really shapes how people understand child abuse and how they understand child sexual abuse. So there's a bit of a feedback loop between the media and what I would call the folk, like you and me and everyone who's a member of society. And it creates a very skewed view of what child abuse is, that the reality is a bit more mundane, that it's going on in households. Well over 80% of children who are sexually abused are abused by somebody known to them. But the press doesn't necessarily report that. We can also maybe tend to use headlines that are sensational and that don't help. You know, things like uh, evil, pedo, monster, caged. It doesn't actually help any public understanding of the issue. In 1992, we would have been one of the first cases in Ireland in particular to talk openly about historical childhood sexual abuse when we took part in the RT documentary, The Silent Scream. And all of the coverage we would have got at the time was exactly that terminology, monster, caged, evil. I mean, what they couldn't have called them. But I have to say, when you are a victim who's finally hit the scene of bringing it to court and going through that whole process, you're not well enough to understand the damage that the media can do to your own life story at that time. In your own mind, frame abuse the way you've heard it and seen it. So you would call your abuser evil, monster, and you use all of that terminology only because that's what you've always grown up with. So when it comes out and you finally get believed, you have a tendency to think that the media are okay referring to your life and your abuser in the same manner that only comes with education and understanding actually that's not very helpful and it doesn't help or serve me to even get my story out for other victims if that terminology is being used on my behalf so there is an issue with that but the other thing is you were saying there peter that the lack of resources to get the information out what kind of resources are we looking at here to be honest it's money get about what you need and assume you have everything you need What would you actually do? We struggle with this all the time. How do you actually get people to listen? We speak openly and people have a huge resistance to hearing and having a normal conversation around this the way you would about any other crime. What do you think that's about? You mentioned, Joyce, that you you find resistance in getting this out there. I find exactly the same. Obviously, I'm not talking from, you know, I'm talking about the work that I'm doing as opposed to a personal experience. But yeah, there's huge resistance. Certainly when we first put the first of the articles up, back then it was in the Irish Times, my editor did say to me, he was surprised to see how well it did online because they're very difficult stories to get people to read. It's much easier to think that it's some monster hiding in the bushes, some guy in a white van 
and for journalists to write things like I like I'm writing about yeah. what's happening in ordinary families around the country, rich, poor, no matter what type of family they are, child abuse can happen. People don't want to hear that because it kind of makes them have to examine their own families, their own friends. You know, they go, oh, my brother would never do that. My father, my grandfather would never do that. And a big part of it, I think, links in with relationship and sexuality education that if you can say to people, look, we're not saying to you, you know, don't trust your own brother and be afraid of everyone. We're just saying to you, educate your children. So your children are empowered to know, teaching children the difference between a a little secret like a chocolate bar next from the tin and then a big secret that makes you feel bad inside. This is what Eve Farrelly from Carrie told me, actually, Carrie, the charity that works with with children who are sexually abused. Like those are the things that we probably need to do. I think a lot of it comes back to education in schools. Um, But people do have a resistance and a reluctance. I found myself as a journalist on many occasions with many issues I've written about thinking, okay, here's a massive piece of work and on a complex and difficult issue, particularly this issue of child sexual abuse, naively thinking, okay, this is going to make a big difference and people are going to see this and we'll cop on and being disappointed when they don't. I think a lot of times it's chipping away, slowly, slowly chipping away. Maybe disheartening for the three of you sometimes to be putting in all this work all the time. But I think you genuinely, genuinely feel, and I've, you know, I've interviewed the three of you many times over the years, that you are making a difference, but it's a slow chipping away. And that the more voices come out, the more people like yourselves speak up, the more that we can get other voices there journalists to write about these topics and I'm not the only one that's writing about them you know Conor Gallagher in the Irish Times does very good work on this Saoirse McGarrigal in the mirror is a real standout uh, the Irish mayor is a real standout journalist in terms of her coverage of the experience of uh, Bill Keneally's victims down in Waterford the more we can get journalists to do this and the more people speak up it just slowly opens more and more chinks of light but I don't think it's something that's going to change overnight I do think we're making progress. I do think we will get there. When you write a piece and you give it into the editor of whatever paper you're submitting it to, is it always your work, word for word, that ends up in the paper, or can they chop and change what they don't like? It's a little bit of both. Personally, as a journalist, I've always avoided self-publishing. I like working with an editor, and I've worked with some very good editors. Uh, Susan Daly in the journal, who's my editor in Noteworthy, She's brilliant. Um, She's been great with the the stories that we have out at the moment. But it's usually a bit of a collaborative process. I've never really had had an editor, you know, take away something that I feel is really important. I've never had to have a a row with an editor, particularly about these issues. I've probably been lucky there. Are you aware of any other journalists who wouldn't have had that experience and felt that somebody else's agenda was coming through the reporting? Yeah, certainly. There'd be certain newspapers that would be known for that. They're not newspapers that I write for. There is one or two that are kind of known for taking very good work a journalist has done and kind of putting their own spin on it. It's not as common in Irish media as you might find in the UK. You have no personal experience of sexual abuse or domestic violence or anything like that. Sure you don't? No, there would be in my extended family, yeah. And do you find that it goes against you or for you when you're writing these kind of stories? Do you um, find it difficult because you don't have personal experience or is it, are you okay with it? Because like, it can be quite disturbing. I find like, certainly there's some of my friends or wider circle of people that I might, you know, mention some of the work I'm doing and they will instantly freeze up and just go, I don't, don't talk to me about that. I don't want to hear it. And I never question them on it because I don't know what their experience is and I wouldn't like to, to, to prompt them on that. I suppose I have sat closely with people who have been raped, with people who have had been sexually abused, with children, people who are very close to me. And I'd like to think as a journalist that I have enough empathy to kind of, to feel that pain personally, or to try and understand what they've gone through. But I mean, there'll be lots of issues I've written about that I wouldn't have personal experience about. As a journalist, I like to try and not be the story, not, not be up front, not make it about me. And I very, very, very rarely write about myself. What do you do for self-care when it comes to, for instance, if you're sitting with the three of us and we're going into detail about abuse, how do you mind yourself in doing that story? Because I can tell you from personal experience of people we have spoken to about our abuse, they've really struggled and had a hard time. 
with not being able to leave it where it belongs and taking on some of the pain. So what do you do to protect yourself? Yeah, good question. Uh, like when it comes to the three of you, I've spoken to you so many times and like amongst, amongst some pretty horrific stuff and some awful experiences, I hope this doesn't sound too bad, but we always have a laugh. I always enjoy talking to the three of you because you have a great sense of humor. Talking to the three of you, it's not really as much of an issue. There are other people I've spoken to where, yeah, I have found it tough. Personally, I am a talker. I'm probably unusual in that respect as a male. I've talked to my friends. I talk to my family. I, you know, I've no issue with like occasionally going to therapy if I think it's, it's something that's worthwhile for me to do. So yeah, I think talking, and maybe that's an issue that, men could consider generally if men maybe spoke a bit more perhaps they would be able to process their own feelings around abuse if they are survivors of abuse they may also be less likely to lash out and perpetuate abuse on innocent people as well so yeah just i talk i talk a lot i never shut up because abuse is in every household very few options when it comes to infiltrating people's homes and getting information to them because of that, the media is very important. It's like we do believe from our perspective, yes, you're right, we do just have to keep chipping away at it. And we'll probably be dead before we know if that's making any difference. We have to believe it is. But I honestly believe it is making a difference. Like you just, you don't always see it straight away, but it is collectively, it's making a difference. I do. I think it's the only way because it's not an either or situation. There was no other alternative but to do it this way. But ultimately, I do believe it's the only way to do it. Because it is so important that we, we use the media to the highest possible advantage and in our attempts to eradicate child sexual abuse. From your position as a journalist, do you have creative ideas from your perspective of what more or what else could be done from the media's perspective to support the eradication of sexual abuse? When journalists report on suicide, we follow guidelines from the Samaritans on how we report on it. I think journalists should also do the same when they're reporting on child abuse. And there is a set of guidelines, which you'll find if you just Google guidance for media reporting on child abuse and neglect actually developed in Northern Ireland. Obviously, they're applicable broadly, including here. I'm sure there might actually be guidelines here as well. The Irish National New Journalist has signed up to them. I would hope that most journalists are familiar with them. I know that some journalists are. I strongly suspect that some journalists are not. There is a little bit of education, I think, that needs to happen kind of within journalism, and that needs to happen in you know, journalism training and in schools that journalists are taught that a big story about individuals is always going to be easier for people to relate to. But it's not necessarily the case that journalists are going, oh, you know, we, we just want some sensationalist. It, it is the case that people are going to relate to. Like, I mean, yourselves, you know, you guys got media coverage because people could kind of go, wow, three sisters. It's a story they, could, they can understand and see. There possibly is a bit of a tendency, and it's a problem. I'm not sure how we get over it in journalism that we we have a tendency to talk to a lot of experts and not actually talk to the people affected when it comes to child abuse it's a particular problem because in an ideal world we will be talking to to parents whose children have been abused and we'd also be talking to those kids who have been abused but because we're not child specialists we don't have the specialty training it's probably not safe for us to do that so the next best thing we can do is to try and get to as many personal stories as we can. Journalists also probably should remember, and again, I'm not criticizing my own profession, like as, there's, as I say, there's great journalists out there. A basic maxim for anything that you're writing about is nothing about us without us. So don't write about a group of individuals without talking to them insofar as that's possible. That isn't always possible. With the story we've been doing on Noteworthy at the Journal over the past couple of weeks, we're talking about the experiences of women and children in particular who are having really difficult times during COVID-19 um, when it comes to child abuse and domestic abuse. And that's extremely difficult for us to actually reach those women and obviously impossible to reach those children. Because if we try to get out and, and talk to women who have just gone into a domestic violence refuge, they're obviously extremely vulnerable. 
and it's a very difficult thing to even for a refuge to even consider asking hey will you talk to this journalist because they'd have to put in a lot of trust in us that we knew exactly what we were doing as will in the world is not necessarily going to be able to talk to someone going through a, a severe a crisis as we're seeing in the domestic violence sphere at the moment also obviously people are afraid for their lives, for their families' lives with COVID-19. I don't know if this is any help to you or not, but I was reading a Twitter last night, a book that came out. The book is called Look What You Made Me Do, and it's written by a domestic abuse survivor. She sounded a lot like us, that she's found her purpose in life was to write this book and help eradicate this issue. Because you can't go to the people, there's a person that has experienced it. So it's not necessarily going to an expert about it. It's going to somebody who has come out the other end and written about it. Generally, as a journalist, I'd always make sure that I speak to people who have had experience of the issue. In a live crisis, it's difficult. And like even when I was talking to the three of you, the pain and the trauma of, of abuse is, is always going to be there to an extent. But you're not in the midst of perhaps yeah. a live crisis. That even perhaps somebody who has been abused years ago and has never opened up about it, that could still be potentially a life crisis for them if they haven't had the therapeutic supports at that point. So there's definitely a challenge there for journalists to, to get those stories. And I know that like when we were working in Noteworthy on this story, you know, we really wanted, we didn't want it to be just domestic violence organizations and, and charities, but effectively to some extent it had to be. But what we did focus on was getting those first-hand accounts so that people could understand it difficult to get a balance between getting enough first-hand accounts and then balancing it with kind of the information on policy and theory and academic research and having that presentable to the public that they're going to read it. I can understand that position because you're right if you were to go to victims of child sexual abuse for example before they had any intervention they wouldn't be aware yet of of what they need even but there are people out there now who have, like us, who have come through it, who can now look back in hindsight and know what could or should have been done in certain areas of their life that could have changed the whole trajectory of their life. And you can definitely use the benefit of people like that. It is about actually identifying people like us and like her. Yeah. And there's so many of us out there and naming us as the expert witnesses that when you need yeah. some input into a story and it's too delicate to go to that story, you use people like us. Part of the sadness to do with either domestic violence or child abuse and child trauma is regardless of who you are, the impacts are the same and they tend to last as long as your life lasts. So probably only in this particular crime is it possible to go to somebody who's come through it and can give you exactly what the person who's in it is experiencing. Unlike other crimes, because the impacts are so similar, regardless of the experience, how it impacts you tends, tends to be the same. And if you've come out the other end, you can still relate to where somebody's at in their journey. So in that case, you can always go to an expert a survivor. Neil, I want to bring it back to a statement you made earlier that you think you could make a bigger impact on this crime and getting the story out there if the resources were there. I'm still very interested to know what those resources would look like. People's resistance to hear, they'd rather hear about the stranger in the bush than to realise that this is happening within families. And the fear that that brings up, they don't want to go there. In all of our interviews was they wanted to tell the story and then they didn't care if he lived or died. And that's the treatment most victims receive. And it hasn't changed in 20 odd years. Is there anything we can do to change that? Money is an issue. It absolutely is. It needs brave editors as well, who are willing to kind of to, to take a, a story that is challenging, that people don't necessarily want to hear that mightn't get a huge amount of clicks and um, because people go, oh, child abuse, I can't, I can't look at that, I, I, can't, I can't talk about it. But the other resources would be, beyond journalism, would be going back into education, uh, educating journalists on how to report on this. Uh, but more importantly, what I would see as a resource that, that's needed is 
a completely transformed relationship and sexuality curriculum. Myself in the Irish Times, uh, well, I've been working in the journal as well. Colleagues in the journal, like Michelle Hennessy, who's done great work on this, have highlighted, you know, the fact that instead of kids being told, you know, what a safe touch is, what acceptable boundaries are, what consent means, they're having, you know, fringe religious groups coming into schools and tying them up with sellotape to try and prove some kind of obscure point about chastity. Um, and that's not doing our children any good. They need to be learning about safety. You know, they need to be learning that there's more to safety than just stranger danger. In terms of yourselves and, and maybe, you know, getting your message out there, once you've kind of been featured in, in the paper, you know, because people kind of, this might sound harsh, but I'm, I'll be honest with you, is, you know, a lot of journalists or editors consider, ah, oh, well, we've heard their story. We know what happened to them, but they're not considering, well, it's a bit beyond their story. These women have something to say. You know, I think your podcast does help you to get out there a bit and for journalists to see that you have a, a message beyond that. And I think you really hit the nail on the head there. They have you on, they hear your story, and then they're done with you. And I'd say that kind of feels shit, if you don't mind me saying that. That's another thing they have to be aware of, that they're creating more damage to victims by tossing them aside. You know, you get a new victim coming out, and they're the top news for 24 hours, and then fuck off and die. We don't care. Like, that's the message you're sending them. And you have a responsibility to know that and to be aware of that and to handle it better. I think to some extent that comes back to what I was saying earlier about two things, that the journalists would have guidelines for how, to, for how to approach this and that they familiarize themselves with those guidelines just as much as they would when they're reporting on suicide. I suppose the other thing that comes back to what you're saying there, Joyce, about you know victims feeling that they're kind of used and abused, which is really given the circumstances that they've come from, uh, it's not a feeling that we should that the media should be inflicting on victims. They've already felt used and abused once before. Yeah. But it does come back to resources. You know, a lot of my colleagues, I'm lucky because I have the time to, to do deep investigations into things. A lot of my colleagues might have to produce four or five stories a day. They're good, compassionate people who do care. I know, I know they do. But it's very difficult to kind of do any of the aftercare that might be required. And it's obviously there's increasing pressures on media at, at the moment not looking for you to do something other than it's to manage that in a way that the victim understands this is the process this is not personal this is not about you we're not dissing you we're not throwing you aside because we've got what we wanted from you it's very really important that a victim understands that and doesn't take that personal that if they knew the process it's not as bad and also yeah. when you're covering this type of story that the focus the um, story is her bravery the steps she has taken towards reaching this point and how she supports so many other victims by actually speaking out. Can I ask you a question, Peter? In your sure. opinion, from covering the stories that you've covered, do you ever think we'll get to a stage where somebody waving their anonymity to speak about this isn't a big deal? I think we're far off that, to be honest. I'd like to say, yeah, but... It's less of a deal than it used to be. You know, since Lavinia Kerwick kind of broke the mould in, I think it was 1992, the first rape victim to waive anonymity. And obviously that broke the mould. Lavinia was on Jerry Ryan at the time. She had some struggles afterwards, but she continues to be a, an advocate for, for victims and survivors today. It's definitely not as big a deal as it used to be. It shouldn't be a big deal. Maybe, you know, the Irish justice system needs to consider things like in, in the North where... You don't get anonymity if, if you're accused of sexual crimes, including rape. I'm not saying I necessarily have a view on that, but certainly I think it's something that we should be considering in any reviews we're doing down here. I think it should become the norm where you speak about this crime the way you would about any crime. As wonderful as the work that Carrie and 1 and 4 do, um, they're vastly underfunded, which uh, is kind of damning in terms of how you know, we like to talk about how we want to hang, you know, child abusers, but when it actually comes to the two steps, two very simple steps, properly funding carry and properly funding one in four to provide therapeutic services and to help victims and to also prevent uh, sexual violence in the first place, you know, it wouldn't cost, it's not going to cost billions to fund them. We're talking about a few million. Oh, and the rape crisis centre have to be in there too because they're underfunded as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 
like th- those are things we could do but and it's great that they have advocates and that they have you know child accompaniment services like carry for instance but why is that why is a charity having to do that why is the state yeah. not stepping up to do that it's yeah. i mean i know there's lots of demands on the state and there's going to be particularly over the next few years with the economic crisis that's going to be caused by COVID 19 but really shouldn't children be a priority you know, yeah. children who are sexually abused, like we say that that's the worst thing that could happen to a child, and yet we don't give any resources to prioritise it. What is your opinion on the new guidelines that Tulsa are putting out about abusers being able to interview stress test their victim stories? Um, yeah, from what I understand of them now, and I haven't reported directly on it myself, so I, I'm reluctant to give too much of an opinion, but the it's something that can happen. It's not an obligation on the victim to, to allow it to happen. Um, it's something that Tucson might recommend. I don't know in practice how, how it works out. On the face of it, it doesn't seem great. I think, I think what's happening with the stress testing is probably a consequence of the flaws in the legal system, which is a very yeah. adversarial, traumatic system for a victim to have to go through. I mean, there's very simple things that we could do, like that I've written about in, in my recent piece in Noteworthy. Like, and this is, these are not my ideas. These, these are, you know, experts in the field saying, like in Scotland, for instance, not only can a child's testimony be pre-recorded, but so can the cross-examination. Whereas in Ireland, the testimony can be pre-recorded, but the child could be waiting for years and years. They could go into court and have delay after delay, um, obviously not being able to put this behind them, very, very traumatic and adding to the trauma for that child. But why not pre-record the cross-examination like we do in Scotland? Like, there's simple reforms we could make to the legal system. There are much more complex ones that we need to make as well. But just even something little like that would make a difference. But I suspect, and I'm trying to be as fair as I can to Tusla in, in this, that they're operating in the context of the adversarial legal system that we have. It would be very interesting for you to do a piece of work your next time you have nothing else to do. On the things you feel would help journalists to know that would help them deal with cases like that? Or if there's any tips you can give us that we can do a podcast on, you know, to cover, to help journalists? First and foremost, read the guidelines on um, media reporting of child abuse and neglect, which are developed by the National Union of Journalists the Northern Ireland Association of Social Workers and the Northern Ireland NSPCC. I suspect there might be Irish ones as well. I just, I might have to dig them out. Secondly, just try and read up on this. Talk to experts and talk to survivors. You remember that maxim of nothing about us without us. So make sure that, you know, you have the voices of people who've been through it front and centre as much as you possibly can. And if you can't get to them directly, even if you can get secondhand stories from their advocates and the people that represent them that's I suppose it, that that will do and I've been in that position myself where that's all I've been able to do other things that could be done education in schools are, are around consent and I, I think the more journalists write about that as well that will eventually feed into this trying to understand the legal system and how it works for victims is another important thing I think that journalists can do look into like any funds or grants you can get because in order to do anything requires a level of detail in such a complex issue uh, you're going to need money you're going to need funds and there isn't as many of them as there used to be and yeah try and find brave editors that will publish a story and that will support you you know and give you that space and and time to to write about it because as much as you know as much as i'd love to write about this all the time i still have bills to pay you know as every journalist does and buy a paper <laughs> if everyone buys a paper and maybe you know subscribe you know find a media that you like if you like the Irish Times subscribe to them if you you know if you like the mayor buy the mayor occasionally if you like the journal you can um you can fund them directly now or you can fund our projects at Noteworthy as well because unless people actually support journalism and good journalism um, it won't last it won't survive It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Peter, and we need more journalists like you and definitely people that are willing to shine a light on this issue. It's really invaluable. And your your open mindedness is a a great bonus when you're dealing with this topic. And the fact that you can handle it 
given that you don't have personal experience of it yourself, is really remarkable and a credit to you. And we look forward to seeing you again because no doubt our paths will cross. Thank you so much for having me on. I, I really enjoyed chatting to you, as I always do. So if I can ever help, you know, you have my number, get in touch anytime. The Noteworthy Pieces will be published on Monday, April the 20th and Tuesday, April 21st. Thank you for listening. Hopefully some of the information we've shared will resonate with you and bring you to a place where you can have compassion for yourself. Please know that no matter how you feel or how you respond to the abuse, it was normal. We're hopeful and optimistic that those in a position of power to bring about change will be moved into action so we can finally eradicate childhood sexual abuse. So please spread the word and share the information. The decision to heal from childhood sexual abuse places you on the most important journey of your life. You're in charge of this journey. Only you know what works for you and what doesn't. It takes as long as it takes because there's no rush in it and there's no fake in it. You have to feel it. And just as the ripple of pain that you're in goes out and impacts all of those around you, so does the healing. And the more you heal, the more everyone around you benefits from your healing. You've been listening to the Cavern Sisters podcast. You can contact us through Facebook, Twitter and Instagram or email the Cavern Sisters at gmail.com. We'd like to leave you with a thought for the day. Although there is nothing quite like experience for teaching lessons, if you could prepare for a painful experience through listening to others, isn't it wise to listen? After all, forewarned is forearmed.